there. I'm so glad you stopped by for this podcast. We hope so much we can serve you today. We had so much fun talking backstage, and I wish so much you had been in on a lot of that because we discussed what happens when you want to be a person who delights in God, but a lot of people around you are cynical about God. Let me tell you something. You can have delight all by yourself. The beautiful part about it, though, is it is highly contagious, highly contagious. It sneezes and gets its holy germs all over everybody. But ladies, what I want to say to you, because a number of you may have cynical husbands, you know what? Give up beating them over the head with the sword of the Spirit. Don't use the sword as a weapon. Do you remember when Peter drew his sword and cut off the ear of the servant? And actually, he was going for his neck because if you'll think about it, what he did, he pulled the sword out this way. It would have been on this side of, on this left hip. He pulled it out like this, and it says he cut off his ear. Well, how did he do that? Did he hold it still and go, stand there just for a second while I... No. What he did was swung it like this, and he dipped his head like this, and he took his ear off. That's what makes sense to us. But you know what occurs to me about that scene over and over again? Very often, that's what we're doing with the Bible. We're cutting off people's ears. Because we become so toxic in our religiosity that we're turning everybody off. I tell you what, you be a person of holy passion. You be a person that learns to delight. Ask God to fill you with the fruit of his spirit according to Galatians 5, 22 and 23. That we be filled with his love, with his joy, with his peace, with his patience, with his kindness, his goodness, his gentleness, faithfulness, and his self-control. And People will notice. People really do want what you have. But we're not going to win them over by telling them that they're wrong. The Holy Spirit is the one that brings the conviction. Now, we don't have to take part in it. I've been asked by more women what they are to do when they've got a husband that wants to use pornography, and it could also be the woman. So this is not a gender thing. When they want to use pornography in the bedroom, that is wrong. And then it is getting you a party to something that is dead wrong and highly destructive and invites unfaithfulness. That's a different matter. You do have the right to get to refuse to do something that is blatant sin. But we want to win them. We're more likely to win them with our love and our joy and our peace and our patience. I've got to tell you something. I was telling them backstage that I've had more fun with all these husbands of the women that have been involved in the Bible studies. Thankfully, the thing that I've heard most from husbands is uh, my wife is so much happier and has so much more joy in the home. And that's what I hope they're seeing. I hope that what we're going to see happens in the life of a woman or a man is that the more God overtakes them with his joy and his delight and his love and his peace and his patience, the more people around them are blessed by them. But occasionally, I'll have a man write and he'll tell me that his wife is in one of the Bible studies and she's not behaving. And he'll tell on her. And he wants me to call her and talk to her about it. It just cracks me up. One time I got a letter from a man that had asked his wife, he had written me and asked his wife to mail it for him. Duh, she's going to open it and read it, which she did. So she opened it and read it and she wrote all over the margins and she went, he's not telling you the truth right here. All I could think to write back was, you both need therapy. You both need help. And I understand needing help. I needed help. My husband needed help. Get some therapy. Amen. I want you to look at Psalm 37, verse 4. Let's start at verse 3. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will do this. Do you see that? He will do this. Everybody say he will do it. Because I had somebody backstage. It helps me so much to talk to them because it makes me know what's going through some of your minds if I can hear from you in a little cell group backstage. And so one of them was saying, I so want to delight in him, Beth, but I don't know if I can. It's it's not you doing it. You're asking him, our deal is this. You have been challenged over the next 365 days. So let's just say over 2004, what I have challenged you to do is say, God, become the delight of my life. 
Lord, I desire for you to be the greatest delight of my life. He is the one that brings it to pass. You tell him that that is your desire. All you have to do is bring him your sincere desire. It may be that it's not your desire yet. Well, bring him the desire to have the desire. I'm not even aware, Lord, I could say that I want you to be the most important and most wonderful and most passionate thing in my life. But I can tell you that I wish I did feel that way. So I bring you that wish. I bring you that want. I want to feel that way. Would you give it to me? It all comes from God. It all originates in God. All faith. He is the author and finisher of our faith. All things are initiated by God. So you're saying, God, I know this is what you want for me. You remember last night when I said that I had asked for the sanctification of my family line, that there be true lovers of God. And I said, I won't take no for an answer. I thought later, whoa, my mouth got away from me. But I want to tell you why I could be so bold. Because it is the will of God. When we're praying in his will, I know it is God's will for there to be in our generational line, true lovers of God and true lovers of his word. So that we can beat on that door. We can say with all of our hearts, God, bring that to pass. And I believe you to, because those are things that God has sanctioned for us in his word. I want you to see a couple of things as we close out together. First of all, I want you to see that third verse, trust in the Lord, trust in the Lord. I want to leave you with a couple of comments. And the first one is trust in the Lord. That word trust in the Hebrew language is a word that means to attach oneself, make your chief attachment to him. There are so many things that we're attached to in life, but he's saying, you better make your chief attachment to me. Because anything else you're hanging on to, you are hanging on by a thread. You understand what I'm saying? When it comes to our chief attachment, it is also a word that I find very intriguing. It means to feel safe. Now, gentlemen, you're probably not going to be able to go with me where I'm about to go because, boy, this is going to be so gender biased. But I want to talk to the women about one of the chief needs we have. Listen to the rest of this definition. This is coming out of my lexicon. It expresses the feeling of safety and security that is felt when one can rely on someone. Listen to this out of Strong's Dictionary. Safety, both the fact and the feeling. That word trust means to find your safety. It means that you know you are safe in him. I was telling the women backstage that verse that says that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Somebody in this room here today needs to know what some of them needed to know. God has no dark side. Do I need to say that again? God has no dark side. Have you ever met somebody and gotten to know somebody and gotten in a relationship with somebody that you came to the stark realization had a dangerous dark side to them? God doesn't have one. God is not abusive. Would everybody say that? God is not abusive. God is not going to abuse you. He's not going to misuse you. God wants to redeem every single loss, failure, and hurt in your entire life and cause you to bear forth much fruit, cause your life to matter, cause your life to contribute into your generation. You were chosen for this generation. He is for you, not against you. You can feel safe with him. God is not unhealthy. God doesn't have an unhealthy emotional need that he needs to be met in quashing you. He's not that way. God is completely self-existent. And I love knowing that. That he doesn't come to me out of some sick need that he has. He's complete. He comes to us out of love. And we are safe in him. We are safe in him. A couple of nights ago, I had put our little dogs, and we have three dogs. We live in Animal House. I know nothing else to tell you. And I've just found out that my uh, oldest daughter and her husband are going to be moving to the UK to serve there for about six months, and now I'm going to have their cat too. And so it's just, you talk about Animal House. So we have got it. We've got it. And I had decided that night, it was really cold in the house, and Keith and I love to keep the thermostat down and maybe a fire going or whatever, but it's cold so seldom in Houston that we really enjoy it. But the pets don't enjoy it. 
So what I had done, I thought, you know, the little Toby, the dachshund, we got really big dogs, and then we've got this little dachshund. She's extremely old, and her bones really get cold fast. So I thought, I know what I'm going to do. I had a big, big terry cloth robe that is man size, and Keith, Texas men do not wear robes. They just do not. They, they practically sleep with their cowboy boots on. So you got to get this whole picture. But somebody gave it to us. Well, he is not about to wear that. And it says his mercies are new every morning. He's not going to wear that. He believes that, but he's not going to wear a robe that says it. He's just not going to. It's not Keith. But he appreciates it. He just doesn't want to put it on. So... I decided it stays so warm and I decided to put it in the dryer and make it nice and hot and that I would just wrap our little dachshund in it in the little bathroom where she sleeps. I knew she would love it. I often do that with her blanket. But I thought, I'm going to do that with that robe. I might as well make use of that in that way because I I love that robe. But it's too hot most of the time. Perfect for tonight. So I wrapped her in it. She loved it. She never made a move. She was as still as could be. And I walked out, went to bed later on. Three in the morning, I heard her howling. I mean howling. This dog was not crying. This dog was howling. And I jumped up and I went in there and she had wedged herself so that she could feel all the safer and more secure and all the warmer. She had gone down into one of the arms. And she has a little water weight problem. She tends to carry some weight in the hips. So she was stuck in the arm. And I literally had to do like this to shake her out. And I mean, she's going, oh, 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 oh. And I was going, bear with me, bear with me. Because I couldn't pull her out. I had to shake her out. And so it was a very, it was a fairly violent procedure for her to be free. Now, I need some of you to know that. Because some of us in this room have done exactly that. This is where I want to get gender biased here. My husband is, is a dear man. He's also the biggest handful. But he is a dear, dear man. And he is the kind that really will ask you how you feel. He just, he's just tender. And, you know, at times, I, I know that we women are so hard for men to understand because we'll be crying and our husbands will say, why are you crying? Well, we don't know. We do not know the reason why we're crying. And if you keep asking me, I'm going to decide it was you. So just ask me once because I'm going to be mad at you. You need to understand something. She's going to be mad if you don't ask her once. So you've got to ask him at least once, men. Do not misunderstand. Don't say, well, Beth said not to ask. No, I didn't say that. You better go and you better act like it's you and say you're sorry in advance. And then when you know it's not, then you're off the hook. Glory to God, go golf. (laughs) But so he'll ask me from time to time, baby, what do you need from me? What do you need from me? And one time I said to him, I need you to make me feel secure. Do you know what is the number one need a woman has? A man wants to know he's a man. Ladies, I'm going to tell you something. If you're married, you're not doing your marriage any good by cutting that man down and making him feel small. You're you're tearing apart your own marriage because the one thing he needed to know most from you was that he was a man. I'll tell my husband continually because I learned that a long time ago. I'll tell him continually, you are such a man. You are such a man. The more I tell him what a man he is, the more he acts like one. The more I tell him what a mighty man of God he is, the more he acts like a mighty man. A woman told me very early on in my ministry, Beth, if you would treat that man as if he already were everything you want him to become, he would become that. I found it to be true. I found it to be true. Never going to change him by telling him all you wish was different about him. Find something you think is wonderful and pounce on it. But here's what we've done. When I said those words, I realized how true that is. Ladies, do you realize how much trouble we've gotten ourselves into because we're trying to look for somebody to make us feel secure? And do you know that many of us have found ourselves in the biggest mess? The thing of it is we latched onto that for security and it ended up being the death of us. Am I relating to anybody in this room? Isn't it strange? And we find ourselves wedged into something we don't know how to get out of. And don't go thinking I'm talking about marriage. That's a totally different matter. I'm not talking about getting out of your marriage. But I'm telling you, we got a lot of rotten relationships in this room that are not marital. We got some friendships we need to get out of that are unhealthy friendships. I'm going to tell you something I'm seeing more and more in the day we live in, ladies. And that is women and women in inappropriate codependent relationships. 
We got some unhealthy relationships. I tell you, what's become my rule of thumb, you know, I just want to look at people and go, I, before we get to be friends, are you healthy? Because I'm just going to tell you something. I'm too old for a high-maintenance friendship. And I just, I'll still like you, but I just need to know in advance. I need you to know I've already been there and done that. I really I just want to get on with it now and not have to deal with that. For instance, if you have a friend that gets jealous of you when you go do, do something with another friend, you've got you a codependent situation. If you've got you a friend that, is become, that has undermined your marriage, you have got yourself an inappropriate situation. And certainly, if you are in any kind of physical situation with anyone except your spouse, you are in an inappropriate situation. Flee from immorality. Run for your life because it will burn you like nobody's business. And that man that you are sleeping with that is not your husband that you are looking to for security will be the death of you. God is for us. His laws are for us. Let me tell you something. I know better than anybody that his laws for morality were for us not to keep us from having a good time. He meant for me not to go through the pain I went through. We're terribly damaged by that, terribly injured by that, terribly hurt by that. And yes, he can redeem us and heal us, but it is like a burn to the skin. The word of God says it is a, it's a sin against our own body, so it's like being burned. Yes, we can have skin grafting, but heaven, it takes a while and some radical, radical time with God. We've gotten ourselves latched into some situations in order to find security, and we found exactly the opposite. What I want to tell you is this. Sometimes how God will break us free can, free can be violent. I don't mean that literally so much, but I want you to picture what I was doing with that dachshund. Well, I'm going to tell you something. You're in a mess here, so I'm, gonna, I'm having to shake you out pretty hard. In other words, I had to scare that dachshund to death for her to live. Does that mean anything to anybody? Sometimes God will allow a bomb to drop. for us to wake up and be free. Do you remember that wonderful scene? I believe it's in Acts chapter 16 where Paul and Silas are in jail and we're told that an earthquake comes, that they're praising God and they're singing hymns after they've been, the flesh has been beaten off of them and they're in there for the sake of the gospel and they begin singing hymns and praising God and it says an earthquake came and it broke the chains off. Well, do you know sometimes God will allow an earthquake in our lives to break off our chains? At the time, it seems like the worst thing that ever happened to us, but really, it was to set us free. Is he shaking you right now? It's not to injure you. It's to wake us up and set us free. You know, we can be so self-destructive in our hearts that the worst thing that ever happened to us can begin to walk away from us, and we'll still just grab onto it. Don't leave me. Don't leave me. Help us, Father. This is why it is so important that we delight ourselves in the Lord. That our desires become for us instead of against us. We are so prone in our self-destructive human nature to want what will be the death of us. God is for you. God's going to set you up for victory. He's not out to take away all your fun. He's not out to take away all my fun. He's out to set us free. We can trust him. And trust him even in the shake. Even that shake is for you and not against you. Even that earthquake has come. Is there an earthquake going on in your life right now? It has come to break off your chains. I want you to see something else it says. Trust in the Lord. And it says this part. And do good. Everybody say do good. I want you to turn with me to Isaiah 58 because I think this is huge. Isaiah chapter 58. You're going to find it, if you're in the Psalms, you're going to find it by turning now toward the Gospels. And you'll run right into it. I've just finished teaching a series on the fruit of the Spirit. We had never done a video series for that Bible study. It was written years ago, but we had never had the time to do the video series with it. And we've just accomplished it here recently. And one of the things that God gave me to do was 
teach the class little phrases to say to help them remember what we had learned. In other words, like love never fails and peace rules and patience waits. And I taught them all these phrases that God taught me to help them remember what each of these qualities of the fruit of the Spirit accomplishes. And the one he gave me for goodness, because goodness is a fruit of the Spirit, is goodness does. Goodness does. That there's a doing for us to be doing. And I want you to see what it is. Isaiah 58, I want to begin reading in verse 6. Is not this the kind of fasting I have chosen? To loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke? To set the oppressed free and break every yoke? Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter? When you see the naked to clothe him and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood. Then your light will break forth like the dawn and your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help and he will say, here I am. If you do away with the yoke of oppression, with the pointing finger and malicious talk, and if you spend yourselves, everybody say spend yourselves, in behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness and your night will become like the noonday. The Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land and he will strengthen your frame. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. Your people will rebuild the ancient ruins and will raise up the age-old foundations and you will be called a repairer of broken walls, a restorer of streets with dwellings. Look at what this is saying because this This is also a promise. He's saying, let me tell you the fast I have chosen. And what kind of fast he's talking about is there are so many ways we would just like to consume all of our activities on ourselves. We'd like to have all these different kinds of of hobbies and all these kinds of things. And let me tell you, I'm not saying that those things are bad in moderation. But what God is saying is this. Choose at times to forego what would have been something of a hobby that you might want to do and pour your life out for somebody else. Let me tell you what concerns me. Our life, my life message is in the Bible study, Breaking Free. It is the backbone of my testimony. So it means so much to me and it has been the biggest thrill of my life to hear people write in and say that they found some freedom in Christ through what God taught them out of his word. But I'm going to tell you, when somebody writes me and tells me they've done breaking free five times, now I'm not talking about facilitators because they'll do it over and over again because they're teaching different groups. But when someone tells me they've done it five times, I want them to break free from breaking free. I'm going, you know what? If you're not free yet, you're not going to get free in that Bible study. Try something else. Because here's what concerns me. We're to be free so we can get on with it. We we are not to become people who just introspectively see how we can have our needs met. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? Because the number one killer of contentment is self-absorption. And what can happen if we're not careful is that we can adopt that in the spiritual realm. God is all about me. No, we're all about him. And this is all about me finding my freedom in Christ. So, well, you know what? We're to be free to go do something. It is to your Father's glory that you bear much fruit. We're not just free for freedom's sake. We're free to get on with the program. And the program is spend ourselves on others. The reason why some people cannot get out of recovery, I just think sometimes we need to recover from recovery. I'll be honest with you. By the time we've been in recovery 25 years, we need to recover. You might know what I'm talking about. There comes a time when it's time to get out out of all our Christian therapy and get on with living. Because it's the means to an end. It's not an end in itself. And sometimes the reason why we get stuck in recovery is because we don't get out of recovery because we've not learned the out of recovery. Something that is very prevalent in AA is that when you begin to break free, and they don't use that terminology, but I'll use our own terminology. When they begin to break free, they learn very early on, then you pour yourself into somebody else's life. Why is that true? Because God says it is. He says, then 
your light will break forth like the dawn and your healing will quickly appear. You and I are never going to know full healing until we start pouring out our lives for somebody else's sake. As long as it's just all absorbing what God wants to do for us and listen to me carefully, boy, does he want to do a lot in your life. He can never do more through you than he can do in you. So we've got to let him minister to us. But there's a means to an end. He's ministering to us so he can minister through us. And it'll never be complete. We'll be stuck right there if we don't get to where we allow him to then use our lives to just spend them. While you're here, you're only here for such a short time. I mean, I look in the mirror some days and go, "Ah, who is that? Anybody but me? Who is that? When did you get this old? When it, it... you're, some of you are 25 years old. You can't believe that this is going to happen to you. And it happens like that. We're gone in a flash. It's like the vapor of smoke dissipates. Spend it. Spend yourself. You want to have the merriest Christmas you ever had? Don't spend all your money. Spend yourself. Spend some money. Spend yourself the merriest Christmas you'll ever have if you find a shelter to go serve turkey and dressing to people who are homeless. We got to teach this to our children. We've got such self-absorbed children that think life is all about them. And you know what? They are miserable. They are miserable. Every now and then, I absolutely loved my children to pieces, had a blast with my children. But every now and then, I would go, look, globe head, because it'd be like it's big globe on legs. And here I'd see the continent of Asia. Here would come Africa. You are not the world. The planets don't line up around you. God didn't get up this morning going, how can I make her happy today? Spend ourselves. That's what'll make us happy. That's what'll bring healing. Pouring it out where there's not a drop left, where we did the thing, where we did the thing. The last thing I want to say to you is what it says in that next verse in Psalm 37, where it says this, we're told, trust in the Lord. We're told, delight yourself in the Lord. And we're told, commit your way to the Lord. Commit, commit. That is a word that means in the Hebrew language to roll, to roll. It means to roll everything you have on him. What I want to challenge you with before we leave here in just a few minutes is this. Choose to get all the way in. Commit. We live in a culture that says whatever you do, don't commit. I was reading one of those Dear Abby or Ann Landers kinds of, I don't know that for sure that that's what it was, but it was just in the paper. I was reading it just yesterday and, and it was talking about Someone asking advice over someone they were living with outside of marriage and they had met someone else and should they go, they know now that the other person was the one meant for them. And I thought it was the strangest thing and the advice that it gave back to her, it never even mentioned that she had entered into a relationship that would have only been for her destruction to start with. Some of us in this room, I know, are probably living with someone we're not married to. And I'm going to tell you something, God is for you, not against you. His ways are right. He, and sometimes it makes me mad, but he always turns out to be right. He knew what he was talking about all along. But what our culture is saying is don't commit to anything. Don't commit to marriage. Don't commit to a church. You know how many people we have sitting on church pews week after week after week after week that have been there for years and have never joined that church? Why? Because they're not going to commit. Well, you know what? I got news for you today. God is all about commitment. He's going, come on in. Bring everybody your broken self. If your life is in shambles, if your heart is in pieces, I'm saying, bring it all before me and dump it right there. But I want every bit of it. Every messed up bit of it. And I will put you back together. And I will give you a joy you did not even know could exist. Commit. Commit. This is the day to decide that we are in. 
There's a scripture in 1 Chronicles 29, 18. Where the prayer is made for the people of God to have hearts that are loyal to him. And I did a word study on the word loyal. And I found it to be an interesting word. It means all the things you think it does. It means steadfast. It means to be firm. But it said this in the definition, to be ready. To be loyal is to be ready. To be ready. What in the world does that mean? And here's what God began to talk to me about. Loyalty to anyone. And of course, we're going to emphasize that as loyalty to God. But true loyalty to anyone means that certain questions have been answered before they are raised. In other words, as I look down on this sweet married couple right here, in loyalty to one another in a marriage. They have already made a commitment before the temptation of other lovers come into their lives. That question has been answered. No. That's what true loyalty is. What I'm asking you to consider today before we close is committing yourself wholly to God. That doesn't mean you get it together today. Remember, you've either got the label on the inside of your sweater or it's hanging out on your hat. But it means stepping all the way in and going, I'm yours. There's a purpose for why I'm living on this planet in this day and in this time. And you know what, God? I want to fulfill it. And you know what? You will never be fulfilled until you fulfill it. Not ever. His plan for you is good. Commit. Get all the way in. Stop playing the game. Delight never sits on the fence. Delight gets all the way in. You cannot delight from a divided heart. Get all the way in. Commit that some questions have already been answered. And this is the primary one. I choose God. Because I choose God, I choose life. And I'm in. And my loyalty to him is that some questions have already been answered before they come. I tried to teach my girls when they were growing up, and I made a lot of mistakes. But I tried to teach my girls some basic principles, and one of them was this. You do not decide what you're going to say when the temptation to go to bed with somebody comes. You decide that in advance, not in the back seat of a car. You decide in advance. I said, I want to ask you these questions now. Let's talk through scenarios. What are you going to say when the time happens and when the temptation comes? Because you don't decide that in the heat of the moment. Loyalty says, I decide in advance. I want to walk with my God. I'm in. I'm going to commit. You know, the most incredible part about it is that God never wastes anything. Nothing about your life, if you entrust it to Christ, will ever have been in vain. Nothing. Every hurt turns into something that means something. Every loss turns into something that means something. Every loss turns into a gain in Christ. Every time. Every pain. Every failure. Look at that last verse. Verse 23, if the Lord delights in a man's way, he makes his steps firm. He makes his steps firm. I looked up that word steps. I don't even know why I did. But I think it was the leadership of the Holy Spirit because I found a neat definition in one of my commentaries that said, the word is used of the way a person's life unfolds. Picturesquely, as one walks along a path by moving his or her feet. And I kept thinking, Keep moving your feet. We get stuck because we're not moving till we figure out why that happened. Keep moving. One day you'll understand all of it. One day we will know as we've been known. Till then, keep moving with God. Keep moving with God. We've let somebody's hurt of us place us in a situation where we are stuck. Let's get unstuck and start moving with God again. Keep walking. Commit. I'm going to ask the praise team to come. There are so many things that are wonderful about this part of the country. It is a beautiful, beautiful region. But you are inundated 
with so many different philosophies. You really are. And I have a feeling that you are made to feel stupid by much of your culture because you believe this archaic, so to speak, belief system of the Bible. Listen to me. There ain't nothing new under the sun. There ain't nothing new about new age. There ain't nothing new about being your own God. Nothing new about it. So don't let anybody give you that. And let me tell you, if you want, Christianity is not the stupid, stupid man's religion. That nothing will more intellectually stimulate you than the word of God. I told him the other day, I said, you know what? You are everything to me. You make me think, you make me study, you emotionally set me ablaze, you physically make me have strength to go out and serve people. You are everything. He had it all figured out. He created you so that he could meet your every need. He's everything. And you listen carefully before you leave this place and go back out into your culture. Nobody is bigger than your daddy. Nobody. Nobody. You have not been led astray. I assure you that when all is said and done, Christ Jesus will show himself. There will be the great revealing. And every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now would you stand please? And let's make a confession of our faith today. That's what we did in this little group uh, back behind the stage. But theirs was a matter of salvation. For many of you, that decision's already been made. But let's commit ourselves to what we have talked about this weekend. So I'm going to say a phrase to you, and I'm going to ask you to repeat it back to God. And to repeat it as one professing their faith publicly. Lord, on this very day of my personal history, say it. Hear the highest desire of my heart. Become my life's delight. Grant me a passion for your presence and a wonder for your word. Sanctify this heart of mine and grant me the joy of much answered prayer. I give you myself completely. I choose to commit heart, soul, mind, and strength to be spent lavishly for the sake of others and to the glory of your great name. My dearest delight, delight yourself in me. For I am the desire of your heart. Make my delight contagious. Till all around me want Jesus. For thine is the kingdom. The power and the glory. Forever and ever. Amen. Would you shout to God with a voice of triumph. We praise you Lord. You are great and greatly to be praised. You come and capture our hearts and our lives. We will gladly spend ourselves for your glory. We praise you. We thank you, our God. You are magnificent and mighty. Bless you, Lord. Praise you. Oh, how we thank you, Lord. We are so glad you came this weekend. Thank you for spending time with us. Would you conclude with us in a spirit of worship as we leave this place and leave in a great, great cry of victory. Thanks for listening. This podcast is sponsored by Living Proof and Beth Moore. Thank you so much for watching today. It is our joy to serve you at Living Proof Ministries. We do not take a single one of you for granted. Click subscribe so that you don't miss a moment of our time together in Scripture. 